Thank you. So only two days ago, we witnessed a near 28% eclipse of the sun here. Now, <clears throat> that was pretty interesting. But during the 1918 eclipse, 92% of the sun was hidden in Coeur d'Alene. So it was almost dark, and it lasted for about two and a half hours in the afternoon. And on the same day, a group of students from the senior class of Wallace High School visited the old mission at Cataldo. Of course, it would have been an interesting journey going there in the darkness of day. You could imagine the eerie darkness, you know, overcoming you while sitting inside of the old building. And these young graduates were sightseeing like thousands of others who have passed through the doors of that historic building. 1918 set records for the number of visitors, with June being the busiest on record, with 204 that month, and a total of 721 for the year. The structure that would later become an Idaho State Park was becoming more widely known each year, with the number of sightseers and pilgrims increasing on average. Yet for the property it was situated on, a ranch made up of about 800 acres, the time was nearly coming to sell the farm. This evening, I will outline the story of the old mission church's restorations in the early 1900s and its rise in local prominence, but also I'll detail the demise of the old mission ranch. This presentation is drawn from my book, Wilderness Cathedral, which tells the story of the old mission at the Coeur d'Alene's Old Mission State Park, located just a few miles east from here towards Montana. Uh, you can easily see it on the south side of I-90. I'm sure many of you or all of you have seen it. And in this book, I trace the building's history from its founding to the present, examining the, its significance to local communities, religious organizations, the Coeur d'Alene tribe, mining in the Silver Valley, and Pacific Northwest history in general. I investigate the building's importance, not only by covering the early missionary era, but also by examining its public impact over the years into the present time, with the mission's adaptive reuse as a farm, pilgrimage site, tourist destination, and state park. The building was first a Catholic mission. The Jesuit religious order first came here in 1842 to the Coeur d'Alene tribe. And after a few years of trials and relocation, the Jesuit missionaries and the members of the Coeur d'Alene tribe began the construction of the Sacred Heart Mission Church at Cataldo in 1850. The building was substantially completed by 1853, although it was not completed or fully completed until 1865. But due to the government moving the tribe to a reservation that excluded the mission, they abandoned the, the mission in 1877 and they founded a new Sacred Heart mission at DeSmet just south of Lake Coeur d'Alene. And so this is why the old church at Cataldo is known as the old mission, because there's now a new one and an old one. So after 1877, the mission's use changed. So for a time, the land was leased by local farmers. Then the Jesuits reopened it as a mission for white settlers who came in greater numbers during the latter decades of the, of the 1800s. Precious metals had just been discovered in the Silver Valley. And of course, this drew thousands of people to the area. It was also used as a training place for Jesuit brothers. And in the 1890s, the Jesuits began farming the land themselves, which included more than 800 acres, and it became to be known as the Old Mission Ranch. So this work uh, continued under Brother Henry Adams, who uh, worked the farm kind of alone. I mean, he had some helpers, but he was the main driving force behind it. He suddenly died in 1905. And I looked all over, couldn't find the cause of death. But after this, the Jesuits hired a layman, Martin Arnold, who moved there with his family. And this is believed to be the, the Arnold family in front of the old mission there. So the ranch was important to the Jesuits as a source of income, which helped support the recruitment and education of the Jesuit order. 
it could produce as much as 500 tons of acre each year. And in addition to the hay, they harvested lumber, they grew significant amount of vegetables, they raised some livestock, so there's a lot going on there. And they sold these goods to locals, mostly, who relied upon the ranch you know, for these items. And then they also sent some across the Northwest as well, even as far as Seattle. So Arnold was the foreman of the ranch from about 1906 to 1920. And his term there saw the slow destruction of the ranch, but also the rise in prominence of the old mission as a historical monument, as a religious pilgrimage destination. And of course, I don't need to add here that the Coeur d'Alene tribe already considered it as such to them, and they had been visiting it off and on over the years. But it's now that the general public began to take more interest. So Arnold's first trial was caused by the dam in Post Falls, which was completed in 1906. So the ranch was 50 miles upriver, upstream from the dam, but the dam did hold back just enough water to cover their only fresh water source. And it also rendered about 60 acres of lowlands around the river totally useless. So the Jesuits claimed there was $15,000 in damages. But in 1908, the Washington Water Power Company agreed to pay $1,000 in damages and drill a new well at the top of the hill. And they also obtained uh, some easements across the ranch as well. So while the Arnolds worked to keep the ranch going, the old missions, uh, the building significance as an important landmark was becoming more well known, as I said, but time had taken its toll on the wooden structure, making repairs necessary. And it was now the people united efforts to preserve Idaho's oldest standing building. And the first restoration efforts took place in 1909, and for the old mission, this was a start of a bright new future. One photograph here from 1909 shows the front pillars tipping and needing in re, uh, need of repair. Another important photograph from around this time shows significant damage to the facade. I think this is that one. The other one was kind of on the side. You could see the tilting pillar a little easier. So local citizens wrote to the Jesuits and uh, with concern about the building and this prompted them to action. This decision also ensured that they would not sell the mission, although they did receive some offers. Some leading citizens of the city of Wallace wanted to purchase it and preserve it as an Idaho public monument. Harry Day, a leading figure in the mining industry, he wanted to just buy it and use it as his own personal country home. But uh, Father Arthuis, the Jesuits, politely declined to sell the church or even to lease it, saying, we look upon this mission as a family relic, an heirloom, with which we would not consent to part. And of course, they'd already said previously that, you know, because of the, the Coeur d'Alene tribe's involvement, they wouldn't sell it anyways. So Arthuis worked to, to print a small pamphlet about the mission's history to both promote the restoration and to collect money for the effort. The newspapers predicted the historic relic would be a mecca for many curiosity seekers during the coming summer, and that thousands would visit since it would be kept in repair and the building preserved and perpetuated by the Jesuits. One article was entitled, Famous Mission Church to be a Pleasure Resort that enticed men with descriptions of heavily timbered summer resort where hunting and fishing were plentiful. So, and there are numerous newspaper reports like this at the time. It was like the Facebook or Twitter of the old days, you know. So this publicity was just what Arthuis wanted. And it did encourage thousands to go and visit the building in the upcoming years. They replaced interior furnishings. They repaired the facade. They made some minor repairs. You can see here, it's, it looks nice and shiny and bright. Um, the most significant article restored to the church, though, was the original altar and tabernacle that, were, that was crafted by Father Rivali back in the 1850s. So for years, for, for actually for decades, it was sitting in a corner down at Desmet, just, just com completely dilapidated. Okay, 
Anyways, it was falling apart. And so Arthuis also asked about the original Sacred Heart painting that Father Desmet had brought back from Europe in 1844. But this was actually the main work of art now at the church at Desmet. And, you know, they wouldn't part with that. He didn't even ask for it. He asked about it, but he didn't ask for it. Uh, so they found an alternate Sacred Heart painting, and this is the one that is still there today. So although it's not the original, it's still very old, and it was there in, uh, it was above the altar in 1910. So Arthuis also found it significant that there were three Jesuit brothers buried under the church. Father Joseph Caruana, who was in charge of the old mission in the 1860s, told him that Brother Hewitt, Hybrix, and McGeehan were considered very holy men. So visitors consistently came to see this historic building. They came up the Coeur d'Alene River via steamboat through the summer. A company from the city here agreed to ferry visitors to the old mission on Saturday, Sunday, and Monday for a dollar fifty a round trip per person. And they also suggested chartering the steamer Milwaukee, which they said was our fastest and largest boat for larger groups of 30 or more for a flat fee of $30. Quite a deal. The Jesuits also commissioned postcards like this one. And um, these were made to promote the restoration of the mission. And sometimes you can even find them at local uh, secondhand stores. A visitor's register was placed in the mission. And it was there from September 1909 to September 1923. And I went through the whole book and counted 9,095 entries, which were recorded during this time. And on average, you know, on average, they tended to rise over the years. It has signatures uh, from people from all walks of life. Joseph Selty signed it who is the chief of the Coeur d'Alene tribe, along with other members of the tribe. There are signatures from people across the world, but also locally. And there are signatures from Gonzaga University, but I scoured that book and Bing Crosby is not there, just so you know. <laughs> I was hoping to find it. So while the old mission church's popularity grew, the ranch itself decayed. Like other farms along the Coeur d'Alene River, the old mission ranch originally grew abundant crops and herds, but property owners now began to suspect that the rivers were being contaminated. The old mission is only a few miles downriver from the Coeur d'Alene Mining District, which is the world's largest source of silver. They produce more silver than all other states of the US combined, it is rich in other metals as well. So it's produced more than a billion troy ounces of silver and about $8 billion worth of all metals combined. So while the mines have contributed economically to the area, as early as 1900, farmers complained about pollution in the Coeur d'Alene River and litigation over water rights went to the highest courts of Idaho. Until 1910, those mining corporations were the winners. But to prevent further, com further complaints, they constructed impoundment ponds now to contain the byproducts and waste from the mining production process. This included zinc, cadmium, lead, mercury, and arsenic. But in the year 1912, there was severe flooding, and this waste moved downstream, contaminating farms and fields along the lakes and rivers below. So while some mines, they claim to never dump in the river, others admitted to using the river as a disposal system for lead and other pollutants. One contemporary writer from the time, she wrote about the Coeur d'Alene River as flowing with liquid lead. So from 1912 to 1918, the river overflowed five times into the mission property, covering most of the land and once even the entire property, so like the whole valley there. Um, flooding normally replenished the soil and it brought richer harvests each year, but instead now it brought ruin. Jesuit leaders fought with the mining corporations 
for almost nine years over this subject. Jesuit priests Father Paulo Thuis, Francis Dillon, and Paul Sauer communicated relentlessly with the mining representative Bob Wark to find solutions. The Jesuits wanted the mines to cease doing this altogether, but the corporations were only willing to protect the old mission ranch with a dike while continuing to use the river as the dump. So I say the Jesuits, they mined for a change, but the mining corporations refused to listen. The river deposits may have damaged farms before the spring of 1912, but it was then that the landowners complained about a deadly sediment which remained after the spring floods had receded. The mine settled with most farms by simply purchasing easements to continue polluting the farms. Arthuis told Wark that the old mission ranch was also polluted and he asked what could be done about it. And more importantly, how the mines could prevent damage in the future. Wark's temporary solution was to just construct a dike to protect the ranch from the river rather than the river from the mines. So the pollution had a devastating effect on the ranch and consequently on the Jesuit order itself since the ranch's income helped support them. Hay sales slowed and farm animals died. Arthuis told Wark, we have found out lately that it is getting more and more difficult to sell our hay on account of the idea entertained by the general public that it is damaged by the overflow from the river. The mines delayed settlement. And the Jesuits began to realize, in the meantime, how devastating that really was for them. Decreased hay sales was only the beginning. After 1913, Arnhold could no longer harvest the low metals near the river. They simply stopped producing. Animals also began dying from suspected lead poisoning. And by August 25th, 1913, the ranch had lost two horses and they expected others to die. Arthuis employed a veterinarian to conduct a post-mortem post examination, and they found that the deaths, deaths had been caused by the horses feeding on grass covered with slimy deposits left by the river. These efforts on the part of Arthuis helped build a case for the old mission ranch, but it also inspired other landowners to become more involved about protecting their property. One neighbor lost 12 horses in the spring of 1913. The mining corporations, let's see, I want to go back to this one. Uh, the mining corporations settled with uh, landowners along the river, like I said, by purchasing easements, but they also paid out some money, or sometimes they just purchased the land. From the early 1900s until the late 1930s, they settled in this way for nearly 26,000 acres of land. Dealing with other residents along the river might have been a little easier for them than with the owners of the old Mission Ranch. It's, it appears that most of the time the mines reach compromises pretty easily, but it was, it was different with the Jesuits. I mean, they had an international organization working against them. So Wark complained to Arthuis in October 1913 that the company was doing more for the Jesuits' land than for any other land along the river. Arthuis responded with a more precise list detailing all of the damage that it had done. So now he says, well, it's $1,640 before even considering our, our lost hay sales. Arthuis explained how the old Mission Ranch hay sales had dropped drastically. His customers rejected it, saying, stating that the hay raised on land on which so many horses have died is not fit for market. So Wark stalled, he offered $600 in settlement and the Jesuits refused. So as a result of the poor hay market, Arnold had to sell most of the hay as cattle feed at greatly inferior prices. Eventually, he couldn't even sell it because nobody would buy it. And so he raised his own cattle to eat the hay, but then that caused problems because now his own cattle was dying, were dying. So it, it, was, it was a slippery slope and this was, this, this was not working for anyone. At this point, the Jesuit leadership could only say, we are at a loss to know what to do to make our farm pay. The profits hardly made it worth running the ranch. In fact, Arnold was on the verge of resigning at one point, and it was right around this time. Perhaps he couldn't deal with the stress. Um, he might have been concerned about his family's health. So in early 1914, Arthuis wrote to a mine owner saying, conditions 
are getting every day more and more serious as a result of the lead in the water and the river. Neighbors also complained. The corporations could not ignore the facts any longer. Residents living below the mines could no longer deal with their negligence. And our theories believed that it was time for the mines to do, to do something that was lasting, like a lasting solution. And he said, I would suggest that your company seriously study some means of avoiding the contamination of our water supply and the filling up of the bed of the river, which if continued will cause untold injury to us and expense to them. So these early efforts to, pro to promote safer mining methods are commendable, but they also show that the Jesuits didn't want to simply be bought out. They were actually trying to affect some kind of change. So at this point, Arthuis was convinced that a settlement was close at hand, and I'll explain this map in a moment, but future letters to Wark just went unanswered. Now they were just ignoring them. So the Jesuits began to be impatient. Neighbors lost more horses, and they could only foresee losing more animals. Therefore, they, they threatened to put the matter into the hands of their lawyers. The court case, though, of course, was the last thing that the mining corporations wanted. Quiet settlements were much better for them. Better not to arouse the entire public about what was going on. So on April 28, 1914, a settlement, a settlement was finally reached. The mine owners constructed a dike along the old Mission Ranch property to prevent further flooding into the higher fields while sacrificing the fields on the lower side of the property near the river. And it was agreed that if this dike held the floodwaters back from the higher fields, so up that's not the right one. There we go. So these are, this is where the, the fields are to the north of the Cataldo Mission. This little dot right there, that's the mission itself. The Coeur d'Alene River here. And where I-90 is now today, it was here. It goes into Coeur d'Alene right there. Um, there was a slow in the springtime that flowed from here around and around the mission hill like that. And the, there's a boat dock over here. Um, the, the drive to go up to the mission is here and the museum is here. So right here, there was a slow that flowed across the road or under the road, uh, what is now I-90, into the fields up here. And if you're uh, uh, familiar with the land up there, there is, uh, there's a lot of water in this area right now, but that typically would drain out in the, in the late spring. They could use it to plant. So what the, Jesuit, or what the mine corporations proposed was to build this dike, and it's this little red dotted line right here. This is a close-up, so there's a mission. And they also built a, sort of a dam here that only allowed water to flow this way, but not this way. So this was their proposed solution. And, you know, despite the fact that Arthuis, he, he would have rather rejected a settlement he decided to just reach a compromise because the mines were too powerful at this time. The agreement of 1914, this one, remained in place as long as the dike held the floodwaters back and the mines meanwhile continued dumping waste into the river. Um, if the dike failed to hold the water back, then this agreement was null and void. Nature proved to eliminate all of these agreements with excessive flooding in the spring of 1917. By the end of summer, more than two cows and four horses had died, and by the beginning of 1918, other animals were near death. Father Dillon began building a case against, against the mines, and they employed professionals to examine the soil and the remains of the dead livestock. Findings prove that the soil contains considerable amounts of lead and possibly even arsenic. They went to the University of Idaho and they had uh, one of the professors down there con conduct examinations on the liver, kidney, and rumen and lung. And they found that the rumen contained strong tests or uh, showed strong tests for lead. So this was indeed happening. So armed with this new information, the Jesuits planned their attack. In mid-May 1918, they sent a lengthy letter to Bunker Hill and Sullivan Mining Company, illustrating how prior to 1913, the annual river flooding was beneficial for the land. But with each successive year after that, 
The crops and the land and the animals suffered because of that. The, the crops, uh, they decreased in production. So before, the meadow's annual yield was one and a quarter to one and a half tons per acre. But now, um, after five years, they were lucky to even get um, one ton per acre, even with intense cultivation and reseeding. So the land just wasn't working like it was before. So they painted a very bleak picture of the flooding. It was so devastating that it was almost impossible to prevent horses and cattle from being poisoned. If conditions were not safe for livestock, you can only wonder how the caretakers felt about their own safety. So between 1916 and 1918, they lost nine horses and 11 head of cattle. And a number of other animals were extremely sick in the spring of 1918. And the 128 acres of land, the low land next to the river, had not produced crops for five years. So they were at a loss what to do. They knew that the mines would continue to pollute the river. So finally they began calculating losses. Over four years, they calculated $20,000 in losses and they requested compensation as soon as possible. Who knows how high those costs would rise by the end of the harvest season? The fields were hardly producing. So he sent this in a letter and this precise you know, explanation of the damages that shocked the mining officials. They thought the, ass ex the assessment was excessive and all the, all the Jesuits did was just respond with a more precise explanation of what happened and they provided more facts. So at this point, he also began, they also began corresponding with other mines and in an effort to discover whether they had caused damages as well. One admitted to receiving similar complaints. Another denied any part in contaminating the river. Another admitted that they were just an offender in a very small way. So following the initial responses, there ensued a period of silence from the mining corporations. Perhaps they were hoping that the Jesuits would just drop the matter entirely, or maybe that the ranch would somehow start miraculously producing again. But more than likely, they were discussing their options. The Jesuits were not the only ones concerned about the damage to their property. Instead, they were just one among many landowners along the Coeur d'Alene River complaining about the same issue. So these farmers filed numerous cases against the mines. One neighbor claimed $20,000 in damages, another $24,000 in damages, and another $45,000. And these cases I read uh, at the Jesuit archives were at Gonzaga University when I was doing my research. Now it's in Missouri. So I was lucky because it was right here in my backyard at the time. But they have all these numerous court cases and you know, it's, they were very interesting to read. So by the fall of 1919, the mining corporations realized that these landowners would not give up, making it necessary to, to settle. So to solve the matter was costly because it required them to purchase properties which they themselves had made useless. Work requested a definite proposition at this time to settle with the Jesuits. So they responded with the proposition to sell the, the ranch to the mining corporations for $50,000 plus $10,000 for loss of crops and animals. This was not suitable to the mines and they strongly insisted that they didn't want to buy the land, they just wanted an easement. So the same as with others. And they, all, they also asserted again that these were just outrageous claims. But <clears throat> even the Kootenai County Assessor recognized the decreased productivity of the land, its value. Its value decreased by 40% in 1919. So finally, during the last two months of 1919, negotiations began to progress a little bit and the mines surveyed the land and this survey was very thorough. It consisted of a detailed explanation of nine unique areas on the, on the ranch and they produced an oversized map and it's actually a huge map. That's about life size actually on the screen. I just stand on a chair to take a picture. <laughs> so. They also produced, um, they produced a, a document that went along with it and they, they detailed everything that they found. So these are the two most valuable documents that I've, I believe that I found in my research. So uh, the survey also set aside about um, 23 acres right here, this yellow area 
for the, the Jesuits to keep the land around the mission. And that's what became the state park where the mission is today. So the corporations finally decided to just purchase the land to prevent an escalation of the dispute. In the spring of 1920, the Jesuits closed the old mission ranch. So that's 1920. So while the historic building would continue to draw people, the, the ranch would never function again. I have a close up here. Kind of want to look at this a little bit. So this is basically the same picture we just looked at map that we just looked at. So here's where I-90 is today. That's also where the, the Mullen Trail went. Um, the blue are there, uh, these are the blue, uh, these are the fields that were flooded because of the dike. Um, and then of course this is where that the water would flow under the, the road into the meadows in the north. So if we go back, this is the full map of the 800 acres. Um, if you've been there before, there's a road that crosses, actually it's right here, and then the road continues around here as well. So this surrounds their, the original uh, mission claim. And then this was a por portion of land up on the mountain that they added on around 1888. And they, they did that, I think, just for the wood, so they could have wood to, you know, to burn and sell. So after a decisive meeting in early September 1920, Dillon admitted that the situation would have ended in a lawsuit against the mining corporations, but they had just decided to make some small concessions instead. So rather than $60,000, as they previously you know, demanded, they yielded to a lower price of $54,000. And they saw this as an injustice, you know, but they were growing wary of this long and drawn out situation. So in April, on April 15, 1921, the mining corporations officially purchased the old mission ranch and they were now released from all liability for damages. And the Jesuits kept the 22.88 acres, which became, you know, the location of the state park. So after May 1920, when Martin Arnold closed the ranch and moved away, it appeared that the parish house was deserted for a few years. The church was again in need of repair. As the foundation was rotting away and inside the church, people had carved their names on the walls. One person commented that the whole building was shamefully abused. In the wake of World War I, locals decided to, it was time to preserve their local landmarks. So in 1921, the Wallace Board of Trade initiated a movement to preserve the Cataldo Mission. They had done the same thing for the old Mullen tree at, from, at 4th of July Pass, which is now at the Museum of North Idaho. This is it. This initial offer to help with the old mission prompted the Jesuits to work towards the goal of truly restoring the old mission. Meanwhile, the place was literally falling apart. There was a Mrs. Kaiser from Spokane and she found what seemed to be a bundle of rags in the back room of the church, and she gained permission to take them home. She carefully expunged away on them for weeks, for hours and hours with water, and she flattened it out. And afterwards, she realized that it was a painting. It was a painting of hell that had once been displayed on the mission, at the mission. So it was incorporated into the wall, so its absence was pretty obvious. So it actually went here where you can see there's nothing there. So if this was heaven, that was hell. Um, so the newspapers suspected it was pulled down by a vandal and then tossed into the corner. So this lucky find ensured, what, ensured that one of the original paintings at the old mission remained intact and it was donate, donated later back to the mission. Although the old mission's future was unclear at this time, other developments took place there. The provincial superior decided to transfer the remains of the three Jesuit brothers who were buried under the church to Mount St. Michael's Cemetery in Spokane. But they had trouble finding them. This is not the Cataldo mission. This is from the mission at Desmet when you were asking about the, the Jesuits were buried under there. This is a photograph of their graves. But I show it because um, this is a neat photo, but also because it does show what it would have looked like underneath the Cataldo mission. 
So they did find two of the graves under the altar area, but they couldn't find the third. Even Martin Arnold had looked for it years before. He couldn't find it. Um, they had forgotten, though, that it was towards the center of the church, not to the side. And, you know, I'm, I think that they probably dug up half the front of the church looking for this. You know, but they eventually did find it. And they were interred at Mount St. Michael's in between 1925 and 26. The Jesuits continued leading pilgrimages to the old mission after the ranch closed. The Spokane Spokesman Review publicized large gatherings at the mission that promoted the restoration, but also drew attention to the fact that it had been vandalized while not being regularly used, and it was just falling into decay. So they were always writing about these things. The Jesuits finally realized that they could not properly care for the historic building. So in 1924, the Jesuit provincial superior, Joseph Pete, began the process to transfer it to the Catholic Diocese of Boise. And he explained its significance in a letter saying that it was the cradle of Catholic faith in Western Montana, Idaho, and Eastern Montana, and of the Inland Empire. So their only request was that, it, that the building was preserved. That's, that's what they wanted. So by November 9th, 1924, Bishop Gorman spoke with brother, or sorry, Father James Brogan, who was the Dean of Faculty at University, Gonzaga University, about forming a local committee in charge of the property. And the second restoration now began to take shape. Now they just needed someone to lead the movement and organize the operation. So this, this role was fulfilled by Brogan, but also Jerome Day of Wallace, who began planning the preservation of the building as early as 1925. And Day, he was a great choice because he was also the director of the Idaho Historical Society. The Spokane Chronicle proclaimed the good news, historic mission to be preserved. The Committee of Two immediately installed a caretaker to make sure that the building was no longer going to be damaged. And they also proposed the installation of bronze monuments and, you know, with important historical dates. The first to join Brogan and Day in this restoration effort were the Knights of Columbus. And then the Spokane Chamber of Commerce organized an impressive outing to spearhead this restoration on September 26, 1926, with the cooperation of the cities of Coeur d'Alene, Wallace, Kellogg, Burke, and Mullen. So a convoy of 328 automobiles started off in Spokane, and they drove over the pass to the mission. There were around 2,000 people there and 200 members of the Coeur d'Alene tribe. An aged 90-year-old Father Cataldo spoke to them in their own language, and they reminisced about the building's past. So this is him back here with members of the tribe there. And um, so he also spoke to the English-speaking crowd, and he debunked the myth that he built the mission. But that's an error that persists even to this day. Also present was 100-year-old Teresa Benoit, who had carried rocks on her back to help build the foundation. Alice Umas, who was about the same age, also helped build the church. Through an interpreter, an elder named Zachary told white pilgrims about his own participation in the construction of the church many years before. Two others, John Francis Regis and Timothy, explained how they hewed the inside of logs and squared them with the broad axe. This restoration kickoff was successful, and they made some minor repairs in 1927. The restoration committee searched to recover all artifacts that belonged to the place, and they ambitiously um, plan to preserve the church according to its original form. At the same time, they didn't want to change anything that was connected with the building's history. And fortunately, the second restoration made very few um, changes because this simplified the restoration that we made in 1975-76 when it became a state park. And it there, was, there were fires that came up close to the mission. I think in 1933, there was a fire that was coming up the mountain and then it had receded. This story here is probably from the 1860s because there were two fires right next to the mission that, one, one building right next to the mission that burned down. So there was, there's always danger. Now they have, they have um, really high-tech 
uh, suppression system inside the mission that they installed a few years ago to prevent fire. So in June 1928, Father Heitman and the Knights of Columbus invited the Kiwanis Club of Kellogg, Wallace, and Coeur d'Alene to help in the restoration, and the clubs enthusiastically took up the project. Over the next several months, they planned and the restoration committee considered its next steps. On March 19th, 1929, a group of representatives from Kellogg, Wallace, and Coeur d'Alene joined the Spokane Chamber of Commerce, and they proposed a formation of the Old Mission Association to secure $10,000 in order to repair, renovate, paint, and to assist in its perpetual care. It was Senator Donald Callahan from Wallace who gave a stirring appeal at, the, at this meeting to finalize the restoration of the mission. And this restoration would be, you know, the most elaborate to date. They had worked on it in the 1880s, they had restored it in 1909, 1910, but now they wanted to do it, you know, an even better job. The church at that time was in a horrible state. You know, there were columns were leaning again, the, the, in the exterior was, had rotting areas, the floor was sagging on the inside. And the Coeur d'Alene Mine Owners Association, based in the Silver Valley, they generously offered $5,000 on the, on the um, condition that the committee matched that amount. So maybe to their credit, they were trying to do some restoration for what they'd done before. So the largest contributor was the Bunker Hill Sullivan Company, and the second largest was Stanley Easton. The city of Kellogg raised $1,000, as did Coeur d'Alene, and the city of Spokane raised $2,500. So the work progressed. They installed two, uh, two large signs along the road to attract tourists. In 1929, they supervised the transfer of the parish house from its position next to the church to its current location, which is about 50 feet away. And this was done to prevent fire because that had happened before. The final drive to collect the remaining funds were at a, a luncheon at the Davenport Hotel. Newspapers continued to track Spokane's progress towards 2,500. Finally, on October 3rd, 1929, the Spokesman Review announced Cataldo goal reached. The next day they tweeted, no, it's not they tweeted, okay. Sp <laughs> Spokane and other cities, they finished their quota just in time though. The total collection reached nearly $12,000 and this was enough for the restoration, but also a little bit to set aside, you know, to preserve it in the future. And this was raised just in time, just weeks before the great stock market crash. The second restoration of 1929 was really a huge undertaking. Um, yeah, so this here is a picture from before. So here's the parish house where it originally stood. This was built in the 1880s. And now, of course, it's, this side is about you know, over here, as you, as you probably know. This is a picture before this restoration. So pictures before 1929 show that the wood-covered foundation below the porch columns. Uh, you can't see it here. But anyways, the architect decided that they were going to remove this wood facing on the porch foundation altogether. So pictures after the restoration of 1929 show an uncovered stone foundation on the porch. One intriguing photograph of the church during this restoration of 1929 at first appears, you know, looks horrible. But upon closer examination, you know, you can see they were stripping paint. Oops. They were stripping paint to repaint it. Uh, then I noticed this. They had nailed scaffolding to the pillar and the wall here so they could work on the cornice. And I mean, I've, I've looked at this picture over and over again. I can't tell if the roof was gone and they were, were doing something, but I think it's just the way that they had their, you know, this, the light was shining on it because this is pretty bright. But uh, this picture was undated, but I've looked at almost, like almost every picture of this place and I, I'm quite confident this is the 1929 restoration. This was also from the Jesuit archives. So they did all of this work we can see on the outside. On the inside, they repaired the sagging floor, they covered the walls with new sheathing, and they renewed a few other things. And Mrs. Kaiser donated that painting of hell back to 
the church and they reinstalled it where it is today. So without the efforts of so many citizens in these first two restorations, this mission would likely have just gone into ruin with other buildings from the same time period. William Hopkins noted in 1929 that the Spokane House, the Hudson Bay Post above Kettle Falls, the Whitman Mission, the Spalding Mission, all are gone. Now all that remains is the Cataldo Mission. And he voiced the opinion of many in the area. Uh, a local historian, W.D. Vincent, who is the president of the Spokane's Old National Bank, he agreed with others at the time who said that it was one of the most historic points of the Inland Empire. Likewise, those living in Spokane and Coeur d'Alene region considered it their patriotic duty to restore the old mission and to preserve it as a memory of the Northwest pioneer days. So while the old mission lived on, the sale of the, of the old mission ranch marked the end of a long and rich farming history. From 1846 to 1920, the ranch provided food for locals and their livestock. The Coeur d'Alene tribe learned how to farm in those, very, in those very fields which were now ruined. In the final years, the ranch's income had supported the education and formation of Jesuit novices. So the destruction of this farmland's capacity was a great blow to those who relied upon it. And this period from the first restoration that began in 1909 to the second restoration of 1929 marks a time where the old mission unified local communities you know, for a worthy cause. It united various groups of people who are, all worked together to preserve this mission. And it gave them a hopeful and meaningful project after the horrors of the Great War. And it also gave them a way to remember the early days of Idaho. The old mission has stood the test of time. I mentioned the 1918 eclipse earlier this evening. A total eclipse, a total uh, eclipse is a pretty rare event for a given country or region, but a transcontinental total solar eclipse is even more rare, where it traverses the entire US from coast to coast. One occurred in 1918, one occurred in 2017, the next will be in 2045, and after that it will be beyond the 23rd century. So these events, you know, they draw people to see the wonders of nature. And North Idaho has, you know, some pretty interesting natural wonders. But tucked away in our mountains is this small state park and Idaho's oldest building. The Cataldo Mission may not be as amazing as other buildings and churches that you will find throughout the world but it has its own unique beauty and rarity that draws millions through its doors. And like those seniors from the graduating class of Wallace High School in 1918, they walk away, carrying with them a small but mighty memory of our state's history. Thank you. <laughs>